Welcome to the Wealth Management Version 2.0, the Advice Tech Revolution podcast, where we are focused on the business of the business, the business of advice. And specifically, we study and celebrate firms that are leveraging the combination of technology and humanity to deliver better advice to more people and better outcomes for more people through that combination. I'm joined today by Peter Malouk, president and CEO of Creative Planning, who has steered the ship on its path towards national prominence and $100 billion in AUM. Peter's a student of the industry, which should come as no surprise, given he graduated from University of Kansas with four majors. I actually cycled through four majors at Ohio State, Peter, but ended up graduating with just one, so I need to hear more about that, <laughs> as well as a law degree and an MBA. So we want to hear all about that and your your journey, Peter, but let's start where I start with everyone. Tell us your origin story, as well as creative plannings. Peter Malouk, welcome. Hey, it's good to be with you, Gavin. Um, I think you do a great job with these podcasts and uh, with your weekly uh, newsletter as well. So it's fun to fun to talk to you. Um, you know, our, the origin story is, you know, pretty, pretty well known. Um, so I'll keep it super brief that, um, you know, I started as an estate attorney after meandering my way a couple of years trying to figure out what I was going to do uh, when I got out of uh, uh, law school and business school and, uh, you know, wound up working with a lot of advisors. I learned a lot from some pretty amazing financial advisors. Uh, I, I learned a lot about what not to do from some other advisors and really wanted to have a firm that did a lot of things in one place for the client and uh, tailored portfolios and, and was not duly registered. And that led to, you know, creative planning. And, and what we were doing back then was, you know, really unique. I remember reading in industry journals about, hey, if you give away a financial plan, it's, you're diminishing the plan. You shouldn't do that. We were really criticized by a lot of people for that. Now that's become the norm. You know, we were passive uh, in the public markets from the beginning. We, we favored certain alternatives uh, from the beginning. And we were bringing everything in-house, which, you know, there are a couple of uh, competitors that have started to do that a couple of years ago, I think, in response to what clients are, are demanding. But we've been doing this now for 17 years this way. And so, I think that was just really well received uh, in the marketplace uh, back then, and I, the marketplace continues to move in that direction. And so we've been the the recipient uh, of that. That's a little you know little part of why I think we are where we are today. There's a lot of other pieces to that puzzle, but part of it was just doing this, you know, a full decade uh, before really even trying to do it uh, with any scale at all. Right, and, and you make a big deal about the the comprehensive set of services you provide going well beyond base investment management, um, financial planning, but tax planning, preparation, estate planning, in, in insurance, um, trust. So you really are a one-stop shop for, for your clients. It, it, to what degree do you see that, you know, how did your clients bring you there? Um, I, obviously that's a bit of a differentiator Others are trying through different means to cobble together different th those sets of capabilities. But kind of talk about how what what led you there and and based on that the types of clients you serve. Well, part was just an observation of the marketplace early on, and part is from our clients. So I, mean, I, div I divided in two. So in the beginning, when I was doing financial planning for other advisors' clients, or constructing portfolios for other advisors' clients, or preparing wills and trusts for other advisors' clients as an estate and tax attorney. I started to see, you know, it took six years for the light bulb to go off that, hey, clients would like this coordinated for them, right? So that was just that observation. Now, all the things that have been added since then, you know, we've learned from our clients, right? And the clients want to get their business valued and it keeps coming up over and over and over again. You know, maybe we should have this service for them. A large segment of our, our clients have children with special needs. So it makes sense to have planning and legal work uh, with specialists that prepared around that. So there's about, you know, 10, 15 things that we do that we learn from our clients, you know, right. what it is they wanted and how, how do we create it? How do we do it for them? And, but the core, I mean, that was there, you know, January 1, 2004, you know, right at the beginning, we were doing those, those core elements of, you know, being a trustee, uh, doing the legal, doing the tax, doing the planning, doing the investments, but you know, there's 10, 15 other things that we do today. Uh, that are a res response to learning from our clients what they need. And I think our scale has really allowed us to specialize. You know, if there's a, something that only 1% of your clients need, well, you can't do it if you're you know, 20, 30, 40 billion. But today, uh, we can do that. You know, we could go employ a couple people full time to do that one little niche within a niche within a niche. Right. And so it's really allowed us to stay in front of the service offering for our clients. 
that's great. Obviously, it, that approach has served you well at 100 billion, and we'll talk about the the additional 100 plus in in uh, retirement side with with locked in and and other things you already had been doing, but to get to 100. So if I have this right, I, I think you were under 20, maybe five years ago. Is that possible? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I don't even think you have to go that far back. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's insane. Some combination, like some of your peers of, of inorganic, but we'll talk about that, but then also obviously a lot of organic growth, which is of course the, the Holy grail. Um, let, let, let's talk about organic growth. What, um, and maybe tie that into what you measure, what are your key performance metrics around organic growth? And what do you see as the, the different ways that you're driving that within your, within your business? Well, I think, that, I think that what's in common with a lot of large firms is there's some organic and inorganic. Uh, inorganic. I think what's different is the overwhelming majority of the revenue and the assets at creative planning with the private wealth side are organic. And I think that's really, really rare. Uh, among the large, you know, wealth management firms, and yeah. you know, in terms of what we're what we're measuring is we're basically saying, you know, what is our client retention and what are referrals from our clients? To me, that's what tells me are the clients happy or not, right? right? And so, if you can if you can really overwhelm the clients with value, you can convert a client to an advocate, and if you can convert a client to an advocate then you can organically grow. And I think there, there's a lot of math going on in the industry now. PE firm comes in, buys a majority stake in, another, in an RIA, or buys a minority with a lot of preferred rights and a lot of controls, goes in, buys a bunch of stuff, puts it together and sells it in three years. That's the normal deal right. uh, in the private wealth management industry today. And organic is kind of an aside. It slows things down. I mean, you know, it's not that, it's not what anyone is measuring. They're trying to get the, the revenues, you know, double as quick as they can so they can flip the thing to the next PE firm. I'm focused on the very long run. Like, how do I just do so much for the client that they're staying not, you know, three years from now for a transaction, but decades? And how can I really encourage them to be so happy that they're willing to talk to others about why they should come to creative planning? And I think that, you know, there's... the it's one of the few things I think that is unique at Creative is the number of clients that are willing to do that, right? And so for me, what I'm always looking at is what else can I do for that client? What else can I do to give them something faster than they can get somewhere else or better than somewhere else or at a better price than somewhere else so that they feel like they have a real partner? And right. that's when they'll begin to advocate, right? And so I think that's been our my, you know, my thought and I know the thought of you know, all the wealth managers and, and attorneys and CPAs and everyone that comes to work every day at Creative Planning from the beginning to now is that really long game and really focusing on, on that. And that's really led to organic growth that continues to accelerate. And I think that what organic growth lets you do is it lets you have a core culture, right? You have to have that strong tree trunk and then you can go add you know, branches to the tree. But if your whole thing is just cobbled together, you know, if 80% of what you have was acquired, you know, it's like having a tree with branches taped on, you know, it's, it's not the same thing. And not deep uh, and roots necessarily. Not, yeah. And, and so I, to, to me, I look at, uh, I look at our story as a little different just in that regard. Yeah. So with that said, on the, on the inorganic side, you haven't been sitting on the sidelines. Right. Um, you also partnered up with General Atlantic, uh, mm -hmm. A year and a half, two years ago, um, talk about that. What 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 that's meant for you? Uh, so, you know, I, I divide them into two things. So we had done some acquisitions before General Atlantic, and um, they have been a great partner. I mean, they own you know in the teens of creative planning, and they've been very supportive. But they've never injected new money in to do acquisitions or anything like that. Yeah. That was just a you know simple transaction and done. And they've been a great hopefully evergreen, uh, evergreen partner for us. Now, in terms of acquisitions, they're an important part of what we're doing. We're desperate for talent, right? So today at Creative Planning, there are over 100 job openings. I shared with the firm this morning, a big slew of them across everything that we do. Um, we're having a, a hard time you know, keeping up with client demand. And we wanna be able to meet that demand. And what's great about an acquisition is if you can find like-minded individuals, particularly where you already have a team, 
right. so they can fold into the culture and they can fall really integrate into the way that you do things, then, then you can grow even, even faster, right? Because you've got more talented people. And we've done that in a lot of different cities, whether it's Cincinnati or Indianapolis or Atlanta, where we already have a team. And so we're not just saying, hey, we're acquiring this and now you're our team here. Right. I don't think that's good for anybody. You wind up, you do that, you wind up with 30 markets with 30 firms that are doing 30 different things and sharing your name and no one really knows each other or feels a part of the same thing and they're really not integrated. And for us, integration is a key element of our acquisitions. I think it's, it's one of those things that make, attracts some people to us and makes some people go, hey, I'm going another direction, Peter, because I don't want to change my software. I don't want to change the way we do ABC. And we, we require that, right? Whatever we think is the best thing for clients, we want people to be doing that, whether they're in Florida or, or New York or California. And so when someone's looking at joining creative, they know exactly what they're going to get. They know what the investment philosophy is. They know the planning process. They know the software they're going to use. There's no surprises. And because they have a culture to roll into. So for us, if we're in a market already and we can get people to join us there, um, I mean, that's a wonderful thing if they match up, you know, in a lot of ways with what we're already doing. Interesting. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of firms, it's more, you can be whatever you want to be and mm -hmm. you can have your choice of this or that. You've taken a very intentional approach to, we've done the heavy lifting, we've done the hard work, we've built what we consider to be a world-class capability from the technology, how we support advisors, the, the client facing pieces, the investment pieces. Um, and, and this is what it is. <laughs> and and right. it's, you don't have endless choices of, of this or that. So that takes a lot of work to create that, that infrastructure to, to scale that. And, and, you know, obviously you, you, you've invested it in some ways, I would think ahead of the, the, where you're going to be so that you're not overwhelming the system as you've, as you've grown. Can you, can you speak about that in terms of, of that intentional approach to building out a, a really strong infrastructure that, that does scale? Yeah, I mean, I think that, so first, I think that there, there are a lot of great options out there. Like it's, for example, every now and then someone calls me, well, Peter, I want to keep my brand, but I don't want to do HR. And I say, you know what, call right. Focus, right? I think Focus is amazing at that. So that they're the, the right place for you. Or they say, hey, I want to, I want to share a brand, but I want to continue to use my own software and, and, and trade my own way. Well, there's a lot of, you know, companies that, that do that, that I think are in the top 10. We're very focused on the way that we do things. And really, we, we are really constantly trying to refine how do we make this better for the end client? And then we want that to ripple through every advisor here, being able to implement that best practice for the end, uh, the end client. Um, in terms of staying ahead of it, I mean, we've always, you know, a typical year we're growing about you know 30 to 80 percent would be normal uh for us but we've never been able to keep ahead of it so i can't say that with a straight face you know or someone's going to immediately run down the hall and throw something at me we are constantly strained you know we are always hiring we've never not been hiring it didn't matter if it was the pandemic or 0809 the the hiring sign uh you know has always been up we'll probably end this year outside of acquisitions having hired a person every business day we have struggled to keep the bar high and to stay in front of uh, the demand. I mean, there's just no, no question about it, but we know where we're going and we are constantly moving. We're trying to stay several steps ahead. Um, and it's been a little bit of a, a little bit of a struggle. Absolutely. It's yeah, it's easier said than done for sure. And it, you can have the capital and the, the, the framework, but executing is always hard. How about let's let's turn that a little bit toward, to the technology side, and mm. we don't need to get deep into the into the weeds. But at your level, as you think about the client experience, you're trying to deliver the consistency of that across the ever expanding footprint. Um, how has that influenced and, and informed your technology strategy, your technology build? Um, and, and, and a little bit maybe on how that's, how that's evolved and, and where you see that going to deliver you know, the, the best possible advisor experience to help them do their best work for their clients and then ultimately a great client experience. I mean, when we look at technology, we're basically saying, how do we make something faster? 
How do we lower the error rate? And how do we make it as easy as possible on the team to use and the client to understand, right? Yeah. And for most of our solutions, that means we have to build something from scratch. So whether it's the, the way we onboard a client, the way we use our CRM, our financial planning software, all, you know, we are creating those things in-house. We're saying, what do we want it to look like? And we're investing the money and the talent into making those things happen. And then when we do have to use a third-party resource, we often have to work with their team to tailor it to the volume that we have right. uh, to really be able to accommodate what we're, uh, what we're doing. And so I think there's just not a lot of off-the-shelf stuff, uh, I think, for very large uh, RIAs. Um, and I think that we're, we're having to create some of it uh, in-house. And I think that will give us a little bit of a competitive advantage as we start, you know, every quarter it gets a little bit better here. Uh, in terms of meeting those goals, but it's requiring a very, very heavy investment that really wasn't possible for us to do five years ago. And now it's just a normal course of doing business. So some of those tools you're saying CRM planning, these are homegrown. Yeah. Like planning is from beginning to end homegrown. Like the way our advisors use the CRM is, you know, the way we've designed it is, is homegrown. The way a client on boards is through software uh, that that we created and so yeah a lot of these components they're entirely us or they're uh, they wouldn't be recognizable to another another user because and we're, we're willing to do that you know because if we can spend millions of dollars and lower an error rate two percent make something five percent faster well i mean you do that across tens of thousands of clients and you know a thousand people at, at creative planning you can really you know move the needle for everybody involved the client and the team Speaking of, of the technology and, and the client experience and how advisors and clients work together, any things stand out from you know the I guess the past eighteen months? Um, you know, there's the sayings of, of we accelerated digitally ten years in in ten weeks. Um, how how well prepared did you find yourself at the onset? How did you evolve? What do you think are some of the lasting changes coming out of that? You know, I do wonder when people say like digitally they've advanced so much, what do they mean? Does it mean they're just on Zoom more? You know what I mean? Like, Because I'm not seeing <laughs> the digital transformation, um, you know, that everyone's talking about. I do think that the people's willingness to do things like Zoom certainly makes a, a very big uh, difference. Um you know, I, I don't. I think that we have been moving down the field from a technological standpoint. We were so heavily invested in that. But at the end of the day, we are a very high-touch personal firm. We like to see our clients. And so even though we have all of this technology and everything else, the typical meeting at Creative Planning is an advisor sitting in a room with a client. All the technology is not about doing a Zoom with a client instead of going to see them. It's really about running everything that the making sure nothing gets missed with that client, making sure that we bring the right specialists in for that client, making sure we document what needs to be done and not losing track of it uh, correctly and re reducing the error rate, improving the speed. That's really what the technology is about on our end uh, and less about more efficient client communications, which we really value a lot, you know, is, is having that one-on-one -on -one time. Yeah, yeah, makes, makes total sense. Um, you're talking about some of your peers and the different models. I wanted to jump back to that for a second. Some of them are are what I'm call, calling they're tampifying themselves so yeah. that as they're out talking to prospective acquisition targets or or hires, let's say, but for whatever reason, to, to some of the points you made, they don't want to they don't want to sell, they don't want to join, but they like something about the technology, the the investment offering. Are you doing anything in that regard or is it either they join you or or not yeah you're part of creative planning or, or you're not so we had explored this i want to say seven years ago or so in fact i know it was seven years ago because i called the person who um had started who was going to start this for us for her seven year anniversary here recently she's one of our best wealth managers today but she had successfully you know found people that wanted to use us as a as tam and I met these people and they had nice practices, but none of them were people I would have hired. And none of them are people that I would have purchased their practices. And really when it came near the end where we were gonna bring them on, I just said, I cannot, I cannot put the creative playing brand here. I just cannot do it. And we, we spent so much time trying to keep the bar very high. Like all those openings are there. Of course we can fill them quickly, but filling them with the right people is difficult, right? And the reason our clients are advocates 
is they feel that the people here care about them, that they're highly educated and credentialed and competent. You can lose that shine pretty fast. And so having a bunch of people all over America with the creative planning logo uh, and an offering, uh, I'm not interested in it uh, at all. And yeah, it could be another profit center and it could be another thing that we do, uh, but I, I don't want to diminish um, you know, the brand that we're building here. You know, it's, it's, it's if you're a, a partner or an associate at Creative Planning, um, that, that should mean something. And if, if you're not, then, you know, go do it, some, go do it somewhere, somewhere else. So that's just been my personal feeling about it is uh, I'm just not interested to, you know, first of all, our infrastructure can barely keep up with our own growth. I mean, I don't have infrastructure. Even if we were willing to share the brand, we don't have the infrastructure for people to come on to. We're having a hard time keeping up with our own, uh, you know, client demand and advisor growth. And that's of course, always going to be the, the priority. Right. That's a, that's a good problem to have. Um, and, and I can see why you, you stay focused on that. Who, who is, wh what's the profile of an advisor, let's say, and obviously you're, you're uh, lot, have lots of other roles that you're filling for, mm. for, for internal, but what, what's the profile of an advisor? What do they, what do they look like in terms of their preferences around planning, investment management, EQ, DQ, uh, you, you name it. If you could maybe wave your magic wand, what's the, what's the ideal profile look like? I mean, they're a certified financial planner. They were in another independent firm usually. Um, they were not the person you know golfing all day. They're the person that actually knows the stuff and does the work, right? right. They've been in the business over, over 10 years very high EQ, very strong uh, on, from an investment standpoint, and um, is willing to do the work. This is not just a, um, this is not a phone it in role here at Creative Planning. It's a very hands-on role here where you're gonna be sitting with clients, talking with clients, doing planning with clients, very hands-on approach to things. We're very, very, you know, we think we've got a reputation that's fair for being very management light uh, here at Creative Planning. And being, you know, everyone's touching the client uh, one way uh, or another. It's got to be people that enjoy that, that have the expertise, have the credential, and um, and are willing to to actually put in the in the work with the client. It's From not a, just it's not just relationship management. Let me put it that way. I, I hear you. From a investment management and portfolio construction trading standpoint, is that some firms have gotten very. Um, Regiment in terms of, of you know, we, we want you planning, advising, developing business, servicing clients, and we're going to take all that in-house to our, let's see, our in-house TAMP. What, what's, what's, what's your basic approach in terms of the advisors and their hand in portfolio management? Well, I mean, wealth managers have all kinds of support, right? So they're not doing paperwork. They've got a team to do it. They're not doing transfers. They're not doing trading they never place a trade there's a they've got money managers on their team there's a fixed income team and options team the, the people that just monitor their regular uh, accounts they've got a planner a lawyer a CPA, and they have a lot of different people that are on their team that are doing a lot of the carrying out of all the responsibilities but the wealth manager is in charge of making sure that plan gets done with that client and that the promises we make to that client they get kept right and so they're they're the ones that are out front really have to make sure that stuff happens Gotcha. On, on investment management, let's stay there for a second. What's, how would you characterize the creative planning approach to portfolio management? Everyone is trying to, to scale personalization, scale customization uh, in a variety of different ways. What's your, your basic approach there? And maybe from that, we could talk a little bit about um, ESG and, and how you're helping clients align values to the actual implementation of, of their plan. Well, I mean, I think that our one of our issues is, is good and bad is everyone really is customized. I mean, there are actually 40,000 plus unique portfolios at Creative Planning. Our trading team is going to be pushing 100 people here sometime in the next 12 months. All they're doing is trading the accounts. I mean, so it's, it's a very labor intensive deal, even with the technology to manage all of these portfolios separately. We don't take clients and convert them to cash. We work around their value system, their their tax situation, what they want to do. We, we supplement with what we recommend to them, whether it's alternatives or ETFs or individual stocks or whatever. Um, but it's still a very, very labor-intensive, hands-on approach. It's not, you know, 
10 traders waiting for a wealth manager to send in a ticket, right? It's a very hands-on approach to making sure that account really is monitored day to day. Understood. Um, anything you're thinking about in terms of, of broadening it out? What are you doing in terms of say alternatives, private investments? Can't have a podcast without talking crypto. <laughs> so we don't we don't advise our clients to buy crypto, but anything a client wants to buy, you know, we'll buy it for them, but it's not on our recommended list. I think it's just okay. you know, pure speculation at this point. And Maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't, maybe it works out, but it's not the things that people think will work out. I'm not getting, you know, we're not getting sucked into that. And we're not going to recommend it that to anybody, but if the client demands it, you know, of course we'll do it. It's very similar to our position on precious metals. We don't recommend it, but if a client wants it, well, you know, we'll help. Um, but we do own individual stocks, ETFs, private equity, all of those different things where we have a high degree of confidence that things are going to work out over a five to 10 year period. Those are the kinds of things that we're recommending to our clients. Uh, you know, day in and day out. Excellent. So now we'll we'll go 180 from that. Um, I always get these things mixed up. That's the the left side of the brain. We'll go to the the right side. We talked about EQ. As you know, you mentioned weekly reader types of things that I I tend to glom onto. I'm very passionate about all the ways as a as an industry as a profession we can add value beyond those. You know, the basics of portfolio management and, and even basic planning, more the, the math side, and into more how do we help clients really align the things that matter to them with their money and with their assets and, and their financial life. I had a, um, I was just telling somebody this, I had this kind of mini epiphany uh, last week on a plane. I was watching the the Anthony Bourdain documentary, Roadrunner. I don't know if you've seen yeah, that. I've seen it, yeah. And it, it really one of the it hit me in a lot of ways. One way was it just helped me crystallize the difference between success and, and happiness. And you know, so much of the focus of when we think about finances, it's about being successful financially. But are we, you know, from our vantage point as as advisory firms, as advisors, I just feel like there's so much untapped potential, so much more to really improve clients' wellness, their life satisfaction, which yeah, could be everything from learning to spend without guilt, right? Because some of the best savers are also the people that have the hardest time spending and they end up dying really rich, but maybe there's more they could have done during their lifetime. And it could be helping people with aging parents, special needs children, you mentioned. Um, I threw out a lot there, but as, as you think about being this comprehensive wealth manager that that you talked about, that you are, how do you think about those things? Um, what are some of the the areas you're focused on helping your team better connect with people in, in a deeper way? Well, I think that I mean I think you hit the nail on the head of what I think we're all about, which is I mean really uh, everyone has goals when it comes to their money. And goals is just what we call even I mean, their dreams. Do you know what I mean? Like people dream of paying for their kids' education or being able to vacation or at college or being able to go on vacations or being able to help charities. And to the extent you can help them do that, that's the most gratifying thing of, of the professional. Otherwise, all of us in, in RIs would just be working at mutual fund companies or you know, handling just investments instead of doing planning, which is much more, um, you know, much more hands, uh, hands-on endeavor. Um, but I think when you're working with these individuals, um, to me, the, you cannot be happy if you are not at peace, right? So a lot of people, if you look at the number one thing married couples fight about, it's money. The number one thing people over the age of 30 uh, worry about, it's money. The number one cause of loss of sleep for every age group over 20 is money, right? Well, why is that? Why are they worried about it? Well, they don't understand everything, right? And so the extent that you can help educate them you're empowering them to understand it better. And if you do that, you can bring them peace, right? So if, if the person is calling you to ask if they can spend money, don't feel good about that. You've not brought your client peace at all, you know, if they're asking you that question. They should understand exactly what they can do, then they're at, at peace, right? So to me, so much of this is really educating the client. I just take yourself out of the profession for a minute, right? You go to a doctor and one doctor is fumbling around with the equipment and 
explaining, you know, in jargon what to do and then tells you, you know, you've got this issue and you, we need to do, here's a, we need to do C, here's what we're going to do and why. But there's no confidence. It's not explained in English. You don't understand it. There's no visuals. You're not at peace. You're probably more worried than before you went to the doctor, right? You're going to go get second opinion, third opinion. You're going to lay up all night. Instead, you go to a doctor. Let's just say the doctor is not even as smart, but good, good, good enough, right? They take you through a process that you have confidence in, uncovers your issues. They explain in English A, B, and C. They tell you why you're going to do B, that they've done it a hundred times and why you should feel good about it. You're going to go start the regimen and you're going to be at peace, right? And so to me, a big part of this goes to a couple of questions back. EQ, the ability to educate, the ability to empower people, to bring them that peace of mind. They don't need you, right? If they need you for permission to do things, you failed. Right, you have to be able to give them that that peace of mind. I had somebody in here who was like, "Yeah, my last advice every time I want to do a vacation, I called her and she told me yes or no, and what a disaster." Do you know what I mean? Like this person had a you know one two million dollar surplus. We ran their financial education projection. You have to be able to bring people peace to be good at this job, right? And and remove one of the things that causes the most stress from their lives, and make it something that they're comfortable about. Well said, and, and it goes to the difference between having a a financial plan, like on paper in a in a vault or whatever it is, and actually having a plan a plan that I'm I've internalized, understand, believe in, where I I've got that comfort that that uh, that peace of mind to know um, I'm going to be okay, I can spend this. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's true whether you've got 500 bucks in the bank or $50 million, obviously different issues, but still without that, you know, there's some, there's some place you can be at any point across the continuum with the right guidance and support where I know I'm doing the right things. I'm on track. Um, whether that's on the spending side, saving side, investing side, the accumulation side, um, and I think that that's that's a great point. It, along those lines, there's a lot, just like we couldn't do a, a podcast without talking about crypto, we can't do one without talking about AI and and data, where I see that playing into what we just talked about of, you know, especially with larger firms like yours, you've got massive amounts of data. You've been through massive numbers of scenarios with every conceivable permutation around clients, where they are. What what brings them happiness? What brings them peace of mind? What are the right money moves to be making? Anything you can share in terms of, of creative planning, how you're thinking about data, AI, next best, I'm using this term now, next best engagement, um, whether it's that next best action, but ways to anticipate and be predictive and, and help clients think, think about things when it still makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think just like you meet different people, if you've got a reasonably good EQ, you know that different people need to be communicated with different ways, and they value different things. And I think to the extent you have, you know, data that a size, you know, size of organization creative planning would have, we, we might talk to a, a prospect, we might give them different information than a, a client who might be more educated in the way that we do things, more sophisticated and require different communications. And we might, you know, just being able to take those different groups and tailor the communication to them to make sure that they get what they need to stay informed. You know, that's something we weren't doing until you know very recently, and it makes a, a big difference. Peter, we are talking about different ways you, you're growing, and you just had a very large deal in the retirement plan space with locked in retirement services. Can you speak about that and what that means in terms of cross pollination, how that works within the overall creative planning brand? And, and vice versa. I'm really excited about this. This has been really kind of came out of nowhere a few months ago and is really has the potential to be transformative uh, for creative planning, which I'm excited about. It really opens up a new space for us, which is the very large 401k space. We've been very strong in the smaller 401k space and the mid-market 401k right. space, but this really allows us to compete there. So I know our wealth managers are super excited about that. I think for the 401k team coming over from Lockton, they're excited about the ability. If you look at what's happened in that space, it's all about financial education. Right. And that's obviously our core guiding principle here is financial education. So they're excited to be a part of it. I think they're, they're going to have a lot of success in our environment. But the biggest part of this for me 
is the affinity relationship that we've entered into with Lockton, where you know, there's so many more things we can bring our clients that are not right up our alley, but they're right up their alley. And really a lot of things that Lockton, you know, overnight can bring to their clients. And I think it's a very, um, it was a strategic decision for both of us. I and mean, we both could have bought our way into the space uh, exclusively or tried to build something. Uh, but just the overlap was was too perfect. I've known the leadership there for some time. I mean, they've got an unbelievable reputation. They're the largest independent in the space that they're in. They're headquartered in our backyard. I mean, the stories look like they were written by the same people, you know, and I've just thought very highly of that, of the Lockton family and their CEO for a long time. So I think it's just a, it's a it's offering great potential to both organizations. We've got a lot of work to do to execute on it, but it looks really promising. Very exciting. Let, let's, um, in our remaining minutes, let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, you know, scale gives you a lot of advantages and, and we need more scale in this business. The reality is the, the advisor ranks are fairly static um, going down in, in certain places. There's a whole heck of a lot of, of people out there. I was going to say clients, but they're not clients that right. need financial advice and have not traditionally had access to it. Wondering if you've got thoughts about how how we broaden the scope of, of who we can, who we can help. And that's also maybe a little bit of a pivot. I know you're very active, both, well, you, Peter, and you, Creative Planning, in the community, um, uh, bring, bringing, uh, you know, d different assets um, and, and education and involvement to, to the community. So talk about um, helping more people get access to, to financial advice, and then also involvement in the community. Well, I think that if, if you look at financial education, I mean, first of all, it should be taught in school, right? How, how crazy that we don't have one half credit hour of just financial education and preferably another half credit hour on just how to, you know, be reasonably successful in life outside of, you know, financial some education. Of it's, some of it's there, but it's, it's right. pretty crappy. My yeah. daughter, who's a pretty intelligent person, had personal finance oh, and great. didn't realize that she had to file taxes uh, this year. <laughs> well, that's good that she uh, that, that that she's got some education around it. I, you know, what we've done at Creative Planning is when, when we were going through the pandemic and all the social issues that came to the forefront at the same time, we've always done a lot of things for the communities that needed the most help. We've done that, you know, before all of this. So, you know, going back ten years, you know, Creative Planning, we built a couple of food food pantries. Um, we from from scratch, and we stocked them, and we still go to one of them every Thanksgiving. We did this this uh, actually this past weekend where we went and prepared, you know, purchased, assembled, and, and delivered a thousand uh, you know, Thanksgiving meals for families. But those pantries are open year round. Uh, we do a lot of other events, you know, with the part of, com of the community that needs a break. But when we were in this last crisis, we we're really talking about what are we really good at and where can we have the most impact? And we said, well, we're in the financial education business, right? So why don't we, here we have, you know, some of the most talented people in the United States in law and tax, investments, planning, and so on. So we opened Pathway Education Center uh, in, a, in an area of, of the town that could really use it. And part of it does education for kids, you know, teenagers. Part of it does education for business owners and part for adults. And they're all different programs, whether it's debt management or how to scale a business or Great. how to understand basic economics. And I know that people here have found it incredibly rewarding to put together that curriculum, to go teach it. And, you know, we're hopefully to get, get this turned over to the community, you know, have it not be a creative planning thing and then try to replicate it in, in uh, other areas. So that, that's been a lot of fun for us because it's not just us spending money and time, but actually using our expertise to make, it, uh, make a difference. I think it was, it's great here how quick everyone assembled uh, to do that. I love it. And I, I saw that. I follow you on social media. And it seems like you're either at some community event, something with employees out in the community or at a concert, which I'm really <laughs> jealous of. Mm. Um, and we've bonded a little bit over, over music. So I can't let you go without um, talking about music a, a little bit. So what are you listening to these days? What, what maybe best concerts that you've been to either in your life or recently? So, you know, I'm all over the place. I owned music stores while I was in college and I was a DJ uh, when I was in college. I would do everything from fraternity parties to weddings. This is something that went on, you know, right before college through past college. And I was in college for a long time. I was there for eight years. You know, when you're sitting in a music store um, for eight hours, you're listening to 
eight or nine different at the time CDs. And so I heard everything there was to hear. So the palette is, is wide, it's uh, all over the place. But the best, I've been to a lot of concerts. Um, I mean, I don't know if I could say the, the best, but the most energetic was a band called Bleachers, which is you know, the guy from Fun, which maybe some yeah, of your yeah, yeah. viewers recognize. And uh, he put on a show that, you know, it made me wish I was a lot younger than, than I am today. Very, very high energy show. But it doesn't take a lot to please me in that category. You know, my attitude is if thousands of people will pay money to come see you, you're probably pretty good. And I'm probably going to be entertained. I just like live events in general. So I like going to sporting events and concerts. I think my Twitter feed can't take both of them. You know, so I tend not to show all the sporting events, which tend to be Kansas City based. You know, I'm, I live in Kansas City. I'm a Kansas City fan across everything. Uh, I don't think everyone wants to see the Royals, the Chiefs and sporting and all, you know, all those teams all the time. Whereas you could be, you know, where you're living or, or LA or wherever and understand a concert maybe a little bit better, which is why I kind of pick and choose what I, what I throw out there. That makes a lot of sense. I did not know about the DJ. My, my brother, a little older, he was a college DJ and, st and stuck with it. Well, well, afterwards, still has, he was, he's older than you. Um, so he's got a vinyl collection, of like <laughs> 2000 albums still. Uh, wow. So he held it like when it was cool, when it was totally not cool. And now it's super cool. And he held it through all that's very yes. impressive. A lot of people didn't have that <laughs> stamina to last that 20 year period where no one was interested. That is funny. Um, <laughs> speaking of uh, Kansas City and sports. Royals, where are we now? November. How many how many days till pitchers and catchers? Uh, we got. I mean, like they start really early, like in February. But I mean, we're not going to see a game, you know, till till early April. But I we're very optimistic. And Royals fans have to be optimistic, right? So we're very optimistic about what's coming this year. And the Chiefs seem to have turned it around too. So we're pretty excited about. We've got a lot to be, you know, thankful for here in, in Kansas City. Okay. So Peter, you're a youngster, but you're not going to do this forever. What legacy do you want to leave in the business? You know, when I, my dad is 86 and he just retired and I think he only retired. He's a physician because of the pandemic. Otherwise he thought he had a good five years left in him and he, he probably did. Um, and so hopefully I've got decades uh, left, uh, God willing here. And when I think about legacy, I, I really tend to think more family. You know, you really think about um raising kids that are well-adjusted and happy and contribute to society or generous and all of those things. And you really, that's your high impact legacy, right? As your kids, your grandkids, um, when you leave that behind. And I really think about the, the, the legacy as the difference you make that ripples. And when I think about creative planning, I think less of the institution, you know, creative planning and more about, you know, there's 50,000 clients um, and we're impacting all of their legacies. That's one of the things that makes this profession just absolutely amazing. And we talked about the number one thing married couples worry about is money. And to the extent that you can help people accomplish their goals, you pay for, help them pay for college, give, give them the, the feeling of confidence, they can go do something they want to do, help them make a charitable impact, do it in a more tax efficient way so they can do even more for their kids or more for charity. I mean, that's a real legacy. It's 50,000 families that you might have incremental or really big, big impact that can go a generation or two or more. And then I think of our, our team and their legacies. And I think that, you know, one of the things I love about creative planning is a lot of our talent, you know, it just has to come ready to go. You know, they just have to be amazing on day one, but there's a lot of people that we look for their traits. Their roles allow us to look for traits of success. And then we train them up and we really get them to a level where their incomes are better than they ever were before and their families are in a better position than they ever were before. And that is legacy too, you know, for them and their kids and so on. And the community that we, we all, all of those folks live in. And then last I would put creative planning, <laughs> creative planning's legacy, which is obviously still very important to me. Um, but I look at it more as a derivative of everything else. Right. You do those other things. Well, you take care of your clients, you take care of your employees, that's going to be a natural uh, outgrowth of all that. So no, I like, I think that's a great way of looking at it. Peter, building on that, it's been somewhat mythical thus far as, as those boomers, those darn boomers just refuse to die. But whether it's, it's a $30 trillion wealth transfer or 40 trillion or 10 trillion, who knows, there's this fairly prevalent issue in the industry as we think about legacy, 
and, and that wealth transfer of not necessarily forming relationships with G2, you know, G3, and often even with, with a spouse, both members of a, of a couple. So when there is death, when there is a divorce, whatever it is, there's not always that relationship that, that drives continuity um, and helps advisors continue to help that, that family. Do you have any thoughts on, on what we as an industry can do a better job around that and any specific things that you're doing at, at Creative Planning? Well, I think the, I mean, the way most of the industry looks at it is, you know, hey, I'm a 40 year old advisor, you know, what, whatever old advisor is, and I've got this client and the client's going to be with me for 20 years and that's it. You know what I mean? But I think if you're really thinking about serving the family, what your client cares about a lot is their legacy. You know, how is one of their goals? Usually the goal is, hey, I need to be set for the rest of my life. Usually the next goal is I would like my kids or my nieces and nephews or these charities to benefit from all the things that I've done. And so you have a responsibility really to help them figure this out. And if you do it properly, you're meeting the next generation. You really can't right. do it properly and not have some kind of planning that pulls down that next generation. I do think that if you don't have scale, it is difficult. I mean, like you, you've got a hundred clients and you do this, well, now you have 300 clients, right? And you're now added 200 clients that are really cost centers uh, in a way. Right. Um, but it really needs to be, if you're really doing generational planning, and I think there are a lot of firms that do, they're just in the minority, you have to be dealing with multiple generations. If you do that, then of course your company will do better over the long run too. I think you just, for, I think for a lot of people, it depends, are you running a lifestyle practice? Are you trying to run something that in and of itself is going to go on? Yeah, no, that's well said. And, and this sort of goes hand in hand with that in terms of reaching out to a broader, more diverse set of clients than, than the industry typically has. As we look to attract uh, those, those folks, it also means attracting um, and, and, and developing a more diverse set of advisors and, and members of the team to serve those people and, 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 and hopefully what's overall a more diverse set of clients. Any, any thoughts or any, any things you've done in creative planning to help build out that diversity um, within your team and, and your advisor base? Well, I mean, I think that we, that's something that I think we're exceptional at. And I think that we were, were the first uh, to really think about and to really implement. And I think you see the industry trying to migrate some of it, trying to migrate that way as people figure out their positions. Are they going to be a niche player? Are they going to be an active manager? Are they going to focus on alternatives? Are they going to be holistic? Uh, but you see more and more firms kind of copying, you know, to the extent they can, the, the creative planning model. And I think that some of it, you really need scale. I mean, there are a lot of services we have today that we did not have when we were a $50 billion firm. And I think that you really, you really, to serve a client, you have to be able to help them navigate all these little nuances. So, you know, for example, if we have a family that has a special needs child, but we have people here that they know that inside and out, right? Well, it's hard to do if you're a $10 billion firm to be dedicating people to these little niches like that. And so I think that, um, this is one of the many benefits to the end client of scale is the hyper specialization that can come from it. Absolutely. So speaking of scale, somebody asked me recently my thoughts on, on you know, are there any truly national RIAs at this point? And, and creative planning came up within that conversation. So you recently hit that $100 billion AUM mark. Uh, you added over $100 billion plus in, in AUA with the locked-in deal. And we, we, we talked about that. So at this point, do you consider yourself truly a national firm? What are your aspirations uh, in, in that regard? And, and maybe as part of that, what, what do you see as the ultimate creative planning unfair competitive advantage? What's that moat that, that you have and, and continue to, to dig? So I think in terms of are we a national RIA, I think in the sense that you're asking it, the answer is no. Are we national in the sense that if a client prospective client calls in that there's someone in their area that can meet with them and represent creative planning and help them yes but I think what you mean is is there awareness that you're a national RIA and like if you walk out your front door in California or New York or Florida or Texas all of these states where you manage you know billions and billions of dollars and you ask 100 people who's creative planning 99 of them are going to say I don't know so I think the answer is no <laughs> we're not a national RIA in that sense, do we have aspirations? We, we definitely do. And I think we made a conscious decision a few years ago that 
hey, look, you know, someone's going to do this. Um, we think we're doing it the right way. Um, we've been the, the fastest growing firm. I think the marketplace responds to the way that we're, we're doing it organically. And, and I think that um, we, we really just said, do we want to do it? And we made a decision to do it. We invest in the technology and the people and the headquarters and everything to, to do it, to really invest in broadening the offering even more and deepening it even more and, and, and raising national awareness. So we are going to become an, a national RA. I don't think we are there uh, today. In terms of the moat, I don't think anyone really knows what the moat is and, and I'm not gonna share it. I think it to the outside world, I think they there are some criteria I think uh, that people feel like um, they can capture, but I think there is there are some things that we're doing that I think make a very, very big difference. And uh, we're gonna keep it that way as long as we can. The secret sauce. I love it. I appreciate that. In fact, let's end it there. Great way to sign off. Peter Malouk, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Hey, thanks, Gavin.